Hello, I'm Susan Regan, host of Connecticut Valley Views. And my guest today is Robert Borton. He is the CEO of Classical Conversations. So uh, delighted to have you here today. I hope we're going to find out some interesting information. I know that uh, because this is all about homeschooling, this is a segment that's growing. Uh, parents are very much on top of it. And you have a lot of interesting and exciting news to tell us about it. So I will start by saying that the website is about us and your statement is, it is built on family and built for families. Could you give us uh, uh, a little uh, word yeah, so and what that means? Absolutely, Susan, glad to be here. Thanks everyone for tuning in. The Classical Conversations was started in our basement in 1997 in North Carolina. And so uh, my mom started it. And uh, so, you know, built on family, you know, I'm running the organization now and we help uh, people homeschool in over uh, 57 countries and every single state. And uh, the curriculum is written by uh, homeschooling parents who've graduated their kids through high school, who uh, love kids, love learning. And uh, we've picked some of those classics, those uh, best materials through time to uh, create a K through 12 curriculum that any parent can do from home. So it's built uh, by families and it's built for families and you don't have to be an educational expert to homeschool. You just have to love your kids and be willing to do a little bit of work. Okay. Um, now, given the, the statement uh, that you just opened with uh, today about your organization um, and expanding on it, I what we want to do is to give information to parents so they don't feel intimidated by that. Uh, in other words, a lot of parents may have had, you know, uh, obviously public school schooling themselves. They're disappointed in what's being offered to their children today. And where do you see that, I guess, welcoming of all um, ethnic origin people? You said you're in 57 different countries. Um, tell us a little bit more about how they can utilize that, even if they don't feel fully educated themselves. Yeah, absolutely, Susan. That's a great question. Uh, African-American homeschooling is the fastest uh, portion, fastest demographic of homeschooling growth right now. Homeschooling has grown considerably. It's doubled through covid uh, schools opened back up. Uh, you know, we were wondering where people can go back to schools, and so many of them chose to stay. Uh, Pre-COVID, I haven't seen post-COVID numbers, but roughly 20% of the homeschooling population had Hispanic background, Hispanic origin. So, it's uh, the modern homeschooling movement is extremely diverse. Uh, less than 50% are doing it for religious reasons, so people are doing it for safety and for educational purposes. And of course, we all have our family values that we want to get a pass on to our own kids. And what better way to do that than homeschooling? Unlike in the early days, the pioneer days when I was being homeschooled, when there wasn't a whole lot of resources out there and parents were having to go to the library and, you know, the internet, you know, either didn't exist or was just getting off the ground. Um, that now there's a ton of resources for parents. We see uh, parents who are uh, you know, single income moms or even some dads who are homeschooling uh, while working. Uh, the resources are made for homeschooling parents. You don't have to have an educational background or degree. We see people who have a high school diploma sending off their kids off to college on full rides uh, because, you know, they said, uh, you know, I am not going to send my kids to the same uh, institutions that uh, I was educated in. And a lot of people say, you know, I turned out well. And uh, can't my kids uh, do well too? And I would just say to parents, you know, the if you didn't see it in COVID, just know that uh, the institutions of public education have changed. Uh, from Gen Zers, sixty-six percent of Gen Zers don't think uh, lying is wrong. We <laughs> see that less than thirty percent can read or do math at grade level, despite record amounts of money being spent in the government systems and. Um, you know, I know the northern states, uh, you know, they take their education a little bit more seriously maybe than some of the other states. But uh, even if you're doing well, I mean, roughly half of your students aren't reading or uh, being able to do math at grade level. So we know that, uh, you know, my wife was a public school teacher for 10 years. 
And when she started homeschooling our three young kids, she said, they never taught me how to teach. They only taught me how to manage a classroom. And, uh, you know, my brother's fiance was is teaching in the public school system. Now in a private school, she said she just monitors third graders uh, st studying at a computer. And so uh, what's going on in the system, unfortunately, isn't designed for kids anymore. And as parents, you don't need to worry about having a expert uh, degree, being able to do all of these things. What you need to do is be able to just learn one minute ahead of your student um, to have a curiosity to be willing to say, hey, I don't know that. Let's Google it or let's go to the library or, you know, there's a person in our church or on our sports team that their dad does this. Let's call him and ask him and just teach kids how to have a curiosity about life and to become lifelong learners because jobs are changing rapidly. Uh, you know, something like only like 20 percent of the jobs in America today existed 10 years ago. So we can't really do job prep in our country because everything changes so fast. So the best education we can give our kids is one where they can uh, learn anything so that they can be prepared for whatever the future brings. And a classical education and homeschooling does that really well because, you know, none of us claim to be experts at anything except for loving our kids. And it shows that uh, that's actually just enough, that if you love your kids and want them to be educated well, uh, you don't have to graduate from college. You don't have to have a PhD in teaching. Uh, you just have to be willing to, uh, you know, do the work. And the good news is most homeschoolers, once they get in a routine, spend two to three hours a day, you know, in serious study. And the rest of the time, they just start living life together and, you know, teaching kids, you know, those things that you hear about. It's like, well, why don't kids learn how to grocery shop or give change or, balance a checkbook. Well, homeschoolers are doing that around the kitchen table, you know, together as a family uh, outside of that serious learning time. So it's really a freeing education because you're no longer bound by the clock, uh, bound by some bureaucrats idea of when you should be in a building and when you should not be, that you can uh, pursue all that life has. And that's why so many, you know, athletes and musicians and people who really have a calling on their life, choose homeschooling and why you should choose homeschooling as well. Well, I think that what's important about this is that parents are spending more time with their children too, uh, because since the COVID thing um, and people are on the internet constantly, parents have very busy lives, uh, children if they're involved in athletics. Now, what, what about some of the other aspects? Is there a concern for not enough? If you have your children being homeschooled and you're teaching them and you're all learning together and you're learning how to learn, if you will, what about social interaction? Because in a normal public school, you know, you would be playing sports and whatever. Tell us how that's filled in, if you will, in that gap area. Yeah, one of the things we do at Classical Conversations is form local communities that meet once a week to go over the academics together. There's other homeschool co-ops. There's, uh, you know, homeschool athlete, athletics. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we like to call it home-centered education because you're not really at home that much except for maybe those two or three hours together. So you're interacting with people of all ages. You know, you're going to the grocery store and talking to the butcher as a, you know, eight-year-old, asking them questions, asking about where they get the meat and those type of things. So, you know, I just challenge people, you know, if, the average classroom in America has 25 students in it and they're all the exact same age. How many times a day do you interact with just one person that was born the same year you were, uh, much less 25? So it's really um, a false dichotomy. Homeschoolers uh, perform well as adults on all the, the government actually measures uh, how people are socially as adults and how they engage with their local community. And homeschoolers, uh, as far as all the different educational options, score the highest in social ability as an adult. So we, of course, want our kids to be social and have friends. And um, because we're not stuck in a school building, uh, you know, 24, you know, not 24 hours a day, but, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, you know, we have the opportunity to pursue uh, people outside of our zip code and outside of our specific age ranges to become friends with and learn from. All right. Now, with regard to people feeling comfortable in some areas, uh, maybe people are well versed in science. Uh, some uh, were kind of math majors when they were in public school. 
um, other people are interested in history. Now, speaking of history, I just want to mention these two paintings uh, in the background here. Uh, it is, as the viewer is looking at on the left side, it is General MacArthur and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt on the right. Um, I'm mentioning this because they were major parts of history. Uh, these paintings were uh, completed by my mother, uh, Sylvia Davis Patricelli, and um, she did Eleanor uh, from uh, actually two live sittings. General MacArthur was uh, actually from a photograph. And I'm mentioning it because there is a website, and it's sylviadavisart.org, and it is an entire collection of history in itself. There are professional golfers, um, there are paintings from the America's Cup, and so forth. And I urge people to go to that website. You can actually hear um, General MacArthur. There's a taping of his I Will Return, I Shall Return. Uh, and Eleanor, who was speaking at the opening of my mother's exhibition, actually in Hartford Sentinel Hill Hall uh, in 1951, and you can hear her speak at that opening. So anyway, that's a history note. Um, history is, I think, if you don't know history, then you're going to repeat mistakes again. So if you were to choose where is there a most emphasis, uh, obviously we're looking at classical um, a classical curriculum, as you have said, uh, classical conversations, and that would include the math, the science, the English, and so forth. But is there a, a specific area that you feel that you put emphasis on, um, given today's world and what's going on? Yeah, our students learn uh, what we call the timeline. So it's uh, basically 300 different uh, sentences around, or 300 different uh, ideas throughout the written history. And uh, we try to go back and read what people said. So we're not going to necessarily read what prof a professor thinks about what like MacArthur said, we're going to go back and read his speech. And uh, we're going to have a conversation about, you know, what's going on right now? What are you know, what's going on, ge you know, geopolitically. And uh, we're going to read the Federalist Papers, you know, we're going to read Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail. So as classical educators, you know, we're not reading from textbooks, we're going and finding that original source document and reading what the authors themselves had to say and then trying to evaluate that based on the results of history. Was this a good idea or a bad idea? What, uh, you know, what other things could have played in it? So uh, it's all about um, reading what they actually wrote and not someone else's interpretation of it. And of course, uh, you can't read everything they wrote. So you do, you know, do use other sources as well. Uh, and then you go back and you compare them. Okay, well, let's read about, you know, you know, George Washington's uh, farewell address. Uh, you know, let's read that and let's compare that to, you know, uh, you know, some other speech that another famous uh, time of history, you know, let's compare. How are they similar? How are they different? You know, what were the results um, afterwards, you know, how, how did they develop as a person? So a uh, classical education is very uh, set on uh, learning history. As you said, uh, if you don't learn history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yep. And we always say, if you do learn history, you're doomed to watch everyone else repeat it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, sometimes it feels like we're, we're in that mode uh, as class, as those of us who've been classically educated, right? We've tried this before three times in human history and it's never worked out. Can we please not try it again? And, uh, um, uh, but uh, like you said, it, it's a vital part of uh, our our good, solid education. And uh, something that we also focus on is geography, because a lot of history is due to geography. And of course, uh, you know, you could, I know Joe, Jay Leno's not on anymore, but you know, he's famous uh, when he'd go out and ask people like, you know, show me on a map where uh, this this famous thing's going on. You know, there's a war over here. Show me on a map where that is. And of course, uh, you know, people would just fail at it left and right. And, uh, you know, if we don't know our geography, if we don't know our history, then um, we're going to make decisions that have uh, unfortunate consequences. And so it's vital that we have uh, educated public if we're going to keep our republic and if we're going to uh, be able to be a self-governing people. It requires an educated people. All right. And now the obvious question here is, if you're not going to public school and you're doing homeschooling, 
Is there, so I assume tests are given at home, open book, I don't know. And do, do they have to give the results to someone? Do they have to report into someone so that at the end, I guess you could have what one would call a GED? Is there such a thing as a GED being given? Or how is that formulated? Yeah, so each state treats them differently. Uh, so I can't speak specifics to all 50 states. Here in uh, North Carolina, where we live, we have to take an end-of-grade test. Uh, every year, we take it typically at a local private school or a public school. It's the similar end of grade test that they're taking in the government systems. Uh, some states are every other year, uh, and you know some of them have different reporting requirements. So, I always just say if if our current government system is only producing you know less than thirty percent reading at grade level, we don't necessarily um, they have other issues they should probably be focused on than homeschoolers who typically score in the 85 percentile you know we take the act and sat uh we get uh most homeschool most states require you to name your homeschool so you get a degree from the name of that homeschool most states kind of treat them as a uh, private like a private school with you know one or two students or however many kids are in your family mm -hmm. and uh you know colleges are actively recruiting homeschoolers uh businesses are actively recruiting homeschooling graduates so uh, in many ways, we just, you know, let the free market decide uh, how well these students are being educated. And they're showing us that, uh, you know, people who know things uh, want homeschoolers. Do you um, have, I understand there's a program for parents as well, a degree program. Is that correct? Yeah, at Classical Conversations, uh, we have a way for parents to get a master's degree in teaching the classics. Uh, with a partnership with the university uh, that we partner with in Florida. And uh, they basically uh, get credit for some of the teaching that they're doing. They're uh, reading the similar books that we read in high school, writing papers on it, turning it into a professor. And so, uh, you know, we have parents, if you're going to teach for 12 years, your students, you know, they're going to be some of the best educated, you know, mostly women uh, in the world, uh, but there's not any way to accredit that or, uh, there's not, you know, a lot of recognition for that work that they did. And so we found a partner who realized that, hey, these these uh, people are very well educated and should, you know, if they do the work and we can verify they did the work, just like uh, any master's degree program, they should get rewarded for that. We have uh, also have expanded that partnership so parents can finish their, you know, AA or their BA, you know, if they didn't finish uh college or, you know, if they just have a high school degree and want to go get their college degree. So, you know, the difference that classical conversations has even in the homeschooling market um, compared to some of our um, peers and competitors is we really believe in helping the parents and that if you do a good job equipping and educating the parents that they're going to do a great job educating their kids. And, you know, we've seen that result time and time again for 27 years and even if you're not in classical conversations, we have this uh, called CC Practicum, where it's a one-day education boot camp. You don't even have to be homeschooling to attend. They're free. Uh, they're all over the country. So if you go to, uh, if you just Google CC Practicum, you can uh, type in your zip code and see if we got a free uh, education boot camp near you. And we'd love for you to come and we teach you how to educate your kids. And I always say everyone homeschools. I mean, you taught them a language. You taught them how to talk. You didn't have a, you know, a degree in teaching them to talk. You taught them to walk. You taught them to tie their shoes. You taught them how to hold a spoon. Everybody homeschools. A lot of times they just don't realize it because it's just a natural part of parenting. Um, well, what about funding now? Because if parents are going to get involved in this and some parents are going to have to perhaps give up their job or move to a part-time job in order to be able to do this. Because you're saying instead of eight hours in a normal public school, you're saying this is a two to three hour day, so you could share time frame probably with parents in your neighborhood. But what about the funding for it? Is one expected to supply the materials, the books, pencils, pens, et cetera, computers? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we believe uh, that free people will fund education themselves. And so there's not, uh, some states have different tax breaks or different things that you can get um, that's not really widely spread. So, you know, a lot of homeschooling parents, you know, it is a lifestyle decision to uh, give up, uh, you know, chasing the hamster wheel, as it were, you know, all this dream of retiring early if you work, you know, it's an opportunity to spend time with your friends or your kids. 
Um, so it is, uh, it is a lifestyle choice. A lot of homeschooling parents, you know, work part time or, um, you know, manage their schedule. Some, some parents have two, you know, two full-time jobs and they just, you know, maybe one works a different shift than the other. So, uh, you know, we, we don't believe that economic activity is, you know, the necessarily the, the driving factor for all the decisions we should make. But, uh, in general, homeschooling, like you said, it usually costs, I think on average about $700 a year, uh, when you buy all those supplies and, you know, computers and your curriculum. So the expense itself isn't that much. It's the, you know, general loss of income. Cause most families, I would say, you know, if the, uh, you know, one parent is working full time and the other one is likely working, you know, part time or out of the house or, you know, doing entrepreneurship uh, type activities out of their home to help provide, provide some economic activity. So, and once the kids get older, you know, in their teenage years, um, you know, oftentimes they're almost educating themselves and the parents are more acting like a professor and just helping them out when they get into different struggles. So. Uh, yeah. Well, one of, yeah, one of the things that I find the most exciting about, of course, our children are grown, but uh, is that you have, I mean, obviously, depending on your family, you have one child, I mean, one child, two children, three children, or perhaps, as I said, you share the opportunity with a neighbor next door, but that you don't have that ratio in public schools. I mean, I, I don't know what the exact, I mean, it varies, obviously, from state to state, school to school, grade to grade. Uh, you're going to have uh, a, a situation where literally if one child is struggling to some extent you can give them that extra time while another child apparently seems to be moving along at the normal progressive rate so i find that very exciting the idea of, of, of literally one parent to two or three children is is fantastic and you can pursue things and the most exciting part as i mentioned earlier was the fact is that you actually learn how to learn and i can remember history when i took it it was literally read the book, memorize the dates, names, and events. I found it horrendously boring. <laughs> I was <laughs> not that good at it. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea. So this is actually interactive. And I think that's, and it also is the opportunity for young people to decide perhaps what career they might want to go into because if they get involved in science, uh, that could lead them to going into working for NASA. Uh, I mean, you don't know, or a medical thing. So lots of opportunities to pursue things. And, and to me, this would be part of the American dream, being able to do this. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, so have you had a lot of pushback uh, or have you seen or have you heard of or has have any boards of education been pushing back on parents because their curriculums uh, are not suitable according to parents. A lot of uh, issues with regard to uh, genital changing and, and gender changing. And this is not what parents want time spent on. Uh, they, they want, as you said, classical conversations about the, the normal, I guess, historical uh, version of what you should be learning. So <clears throat> they are on a road track to bring in things that they're not, they don't want CRT, Black Lives Matter, and so forth. That's, that's not what they want. But have you he heard of stories where parents have had meetings with Board of Education and they don't want to support the parents? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think, you know, part of the reason homeschooling is growing so much. And for us, we see tremendous growth in uh you know states that have been incorporating some of these uh, radical ideas into the curriculum so uh you know sometimes i say it they're our best salespeople uh because they uh you know kick the parents out they won't let the ch parents see what their kids are learning and you know if the system won't trust the parents the parents shouldn't trust the system and Luckily, uh, when you homeschool that uh, the, there's not a whole lot of uh, direct oversight from the Board of Education on what you can and can't teach uh, or what you must teach. And uh, you have the freedom to pick the curriculum that suits your child the best, that can help them flourish. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an engineer, a computer engineer growing up, and I was actually able to get an internship as a 16-year-old with a local computer engineering company because I was able to work one full day a week during the school year and 
I worked full time for him during the summer and I discovered I did not want to be a computer engineer, but I was able to earn some money for college. So, you know, like you were saying earlier, just the freedom homeschooling gives you to pursue, uh, you know, what your life's path is without roadblocks, without indoctrination um, is just making it so homeschool kids are flourishing. Uh, meanwhile, we see in the government schools, you know, the government's own statistics that, you know, depression is at all time highs, you know, suicide in young people is at all time highs. So there's a real pandemic going on in our education system and the children are the victim of it. Now, COVID obviously has driven uh, the homeschooling too because it's safer to stay home and not to wear your mask in school or whatever the requirements are by the school, whatever the school sets or whatever the governor of the state determines, I guess. Um, but would you be able to give us a guess, a guesstimate, if you will, that since COVID and up till now, what's the rate of moving of uh, parents move children from public school to homeschooling? I mean, yeah, there's roughly 50 million uh, public or 50 million school age children in the United States uh, before COVID. About 2.4 million of those uh, were being homeschooled. And uh, after COVID or during COVID, uh, those who were not doing public school at home, but were, you know, in charge of their own curriculum, rose to anywhere between six and eight million. Obviously, kind of hard to get the specific data just because of everything going on at that time. Uh, you know, one of the not concerns, but just the thoughts of those of us in the homeschool community for the long term was, is it going to drop back down to 2.4 million once the schools start opening up and we actually saw just a slight uh, decrease. So most estimates about 4.8 to 5 million. So, you know, about a million students went back to either a private school or a public school, but the number of homeschoolers has effectively doubled from 2019 to where we are today. Well, Robert, uh, it's been very interesting talking to you and for uh, parents out there who want to get more information, please give the website uh, contact information so that they can follow up for themselves. Yeah, of course, uh, you can search for us, Classical Conversations, and find us uh, find our website, classicalconversations.com, or connect with us on any of the social medias, except for TikTok. We don't do TikTok. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope our viewers uh, have garnered some additional information, and we'll follow up with you, and we very much appreciate you giving your time today to explain Classical Conversations. Um, so, and thank uh, to our viewers for following Connecticut Valley Views. We very much appreciate it. So, uh, we wish you well and uh, look forward to a continuing uh, growth for homeschooling. Thank you, Susan.